Good afternoon. It's Monday, the 17th of February 2014. Welcome to another edition of UK Column Live from our Plymouth, England studios. I'm your host this afternoon, Brian Gerrish, and with me in the studio, of course, is Mike Robinson. Afternoon. Well, the weather, um, I'm afraid to say that uh, virtually everybody in the UK is aware at the moment the weather's appalling. It is in uh, Plymouth. We're back to uh, very heavy rain. Uh, misty drizzle and uh, it's not too warm and of course people in other parts of the country are continuing to suff suffer from the floods which we'll come on to a bit later uh, but we're going to start with is it good news or not um, apparently tv figures are falling uh, well yes but so slightly good news but it's actually pretty marginal really uh, so people according to the bbc people watched three hours 55 minutes and 30 seconds of tv per day in 2013. I'd like to know how they were able to do that. Uh, if that's an average figure, there must be quite a lot of people watching quite a lot more than that. Uh, this is according to the Broadcasters Audience Research Board. Uh, a bit speculative, I think, and that's mainly why uh, they're so keen to move towards uh, uh, smart TVs and, and actually getting proper figures and what people are watching and when they're watching it. Uh, so this apparently was a whole nine minutes less per day than during 2012. Right, as so an average. it's the BBC congratulating themselves on creating what the picture shows, which is the rather sleepy gentleman that, in front of probably that, absolute nonsense on the box. That's absolutely right, and they're saying that 98.5% uh, people, of people are still watching television by television as opposed to on demand and, and other uh, formats on tablets and so on, so people preferring to still watch the goggle box rather than uh, going and doing their own research. So we've got to do something to change that really, don't we? Well, I think we're allowed to say that we, we certainly know that a lot of UK uh, column live viewers and of course our listeners are, are telling us they're simply not watching the TV anymore and particularly not the BBC because they don't trust a word the BBC says. Uh, perhaps if there's some movement on the uh, Jimmy Savile case and uh, digging the real truth out, people might change their views. Well, if we don't trust the BBC, should we trust the royal family? Uh, very interesting question. And um, we just had to pick up on this one. Uh, Prince William vows to destroy all the ivory in Buckingham Palace to send a message to illegal elephant poachers. Uh, now, of course, Mike Robinson has been picking up on the duplicity of our royal family when it comes to killing animals. Uh, but we thought this was all a bit blatant. I must say, the young man's looking a little bit tired and haggard. Is this mm. the... Uh, has he been getting, getting his final instructions before taking over the nation? I don't know. Well, I think he's been uh, doing some shooting. Well, Willie's, Willie's protecting the ivory. Uh, meanwhile, his brother is out making sure that uh, a few water buffalo don't uh, survive longer than they should. And so um, the mirror here picking up on the fact that uh, he's been out hunting. I think this was in South America after the rules have been pledging to protect wildlife. Um, one of the other um, mainstream newspapers has been also pointing out the hypocrisy of the royal family on this issue. Um, and I believe there was a whistleblower from in the establishment saying that they couldn't understand what on earth was going on. With one hand, we're there to protect animals. And with the other hand, we're there to put a bullet in their heads. That's, so, that's why they're protecting the animals. They don't want human activity so the animals can continue to breed so they can then shoot them in the head. That's That's... That is the reason. Right, thanks for that, yeah. Mike. Okay. <laughs> well, flooding, of course, the, um, the hot topic at the moment, and I couldn't resist this article from uh, the Telegraph. Flood hit areas earmarked for more homes. Uh, councils have issued plans to build hundreds of new homes in some of the areas worst affected by the country's flooding. Well, we can... Uh, say with confidence uh, to our audience today that uh, of course this is something that's been going on for many many years that uh, more and more house houses and indeed housing estates have been built on floodplains and uh, although wiser members of the community uh, particularly uh, elderly people with the wisdom and experience to know which areas of their um, area flood have been warning local councils they've simply carried on building new homes on floodplains. This, of course, is not common sense, but it does make sense if the objective is simply to create chaos in the country. Mm. 
But uh, we've had to have a special COBRA meeting, I think, Mike. No, it's just another COBRA meeting. Uh, Cameron enjoys them, it seems. Uh, and uh, after the COBRA meeting, this was yesterday, after the COBRA meeting, he released a statement and he said, uh, at this evening's COBRA meeting, uh, I received an update on the weather conditions tonight and over the coming days. After a thankfully calm day today, some rain is expected at times next week, though not to the levels we've seen. But this additional real rainfall will add to high groundwater levels and will impact slow feeding rivers over the days ahead. And then he went on to say, the recent flooding has been a tragedy for all those affected and my thoughts are with them. I'm sure they appreciate that. Uh, while it is of no com comment, uh, sorry, while it is of no comfort to those individuals, over 1.3 million other homes have been protected since December, and we will continue to invest in flood defence measures to protect even more. So he's, it's almost like he's, uh, despite the absolute failure of uh, Britain's flood defences, uh, it's uh, it's almost like he's he's crowing about some kind of success. Uh, but it, it's yet again <coughs> another sort of little hint. Uh, that um, you know, you're going to have to choose where you're going to live because some properties are going to be protected and some aren't. Um, but it was it was quite interesting that on on, on Friday's uh, Channel Four News uh, they revealed that uh, in fact Dutch emergency flood relief had been turned down by the British government uh, because the British government said, well, actually it's not needed. So a quote from the. Uh, from Ursula Meering, a spokeswoman of the uh, uh, Netherlands Ministry of Infrastructure and Development. She said, we told the British government that we had pumps, emergency dikes and sand, sand uh, bag filling machines available, but they said there was no need for any of this help at present. They said they only needed expertise, so we've sent a team of four dike experts to the UK. Um, so that's a pretty incredible situation, isn't it, where, where a, an ally is, is offering uh, real intensive assistance and we're just telling them go away yeah it, it's fascinating isn't it i mean we can say if if there's one bit of advice we'd certainly take from the dutch it's um, how to stop water coming into the country uh, but of course david cameron knows best doesn't he as we clearly see by the economic performance of the country the um excellent state of the nhs at the moment our transport systems our roads david cameron obviously knows best. Well, indeed he does, and so does Philip Hammond, because, uh, sorry, Philip Hammond's like him up a bit soon there, but anyway, uh, Philip Hammond uh, has announced yesterday on the Andrew Marr Show uh, that he's deploying the Royal Engineers to carry out, uh, quote, a rapid inspection of Britain's flood defences. Uh, he said that, that the Royal Engineers would do in five weeks what would otherwise have taken two years to do. Now, frankly, this is the sort of thing that the armed forces should be used for in these cir circumstances. Uh, and I'm quite sure the Royal Engineers will be more than capable of doing this inspection, but it ends at the inspection. So, you know, why did Hammond not announce that once the engineers have completed their inspection, they're going to begin immediate emergency repairs? Uh, the, winter, the winter's not over yet, is it? No, is it? I wouldn't say no. so. So we have mm. Cameron turning down material help from the Netherlands and Hammond not using the military for any meaningful purpose. Uh, and so it seems to me there's another agenda at work here. We've said it before, uh, fixing things uh, for those that are affected by the floods is not part of that agenda. Yeah, but of course we're now seeing that um, there's, there's constant mention of flooding and climate change, which we're going to come on to, uh, but that is all now all part of national security. So we've, we've got a minister for war, Philip Hammond. Mm. Remember, he was keen to get the attack in on Syria. So we've got the Minister of War is now also an expert on climate change and flooding. Well, they all have to be now, don't they? Uh, probably. Yeah. Well, the BBC here really um, starts the trail. Um, UK storms. Here he is. Hammond says climate change is clearly a factor. We don't. I don't know what his um, qualifications on this subject, met or climate change, are. But there we go. Uh, climate change is clearly a factor in the period of stormy weather the UK has been experiencing, the Defence Secretary have, has said. Mm. Well, that's pretty clear, but of course it's not only Philip Hammond, because here we are with the BBC telling us that uh, the science over climate change is clear. Uh, major article featuring on Mr Miliband, who said what we've learnt from what's happened over the last few weeks, tragically, is that the cost of not acting on climate change in terms of the billions of pounds that are lost in terms of businesses and families, as well as the human costs, are greater than the costs of acting. He added, climate change will mean more floods 
and more storms. And that's why we've got to treat it like any other national security issue. Here's the mix in with national security. And that means uniting as a country behind a national effort to do more to defend against floods, to invest in clean energy and to show leadership internationally, persuade other countries to be part of the fight against climate change. Earlier, he told The Observer that because of political division in Westminster, we are sleepwalking into a national security crisis on climate change. So a fantastic mix of language. We're mixing security and climate change. But also, he says that basically political decision in Westminster is a big problem which has got to be dealt with. And we're going to be having a look at that. But of course, um, Philip Hammond and Miliband, these are low grade MPs. What we really need are quality people who know their science and uh, mathematic and uh, climate modelling in order to tell us what really we should be doing. And here he is. Um, so basically, um, John Prescott has been hard at work advising the British public as uh, what to do. Now, if you're a bit confused by that image, let's break it down. We've got Jim, John, <laughs> Mr. Prescott with his floozy at a party in Westminster. Uh, basically, we've got uh, uh, the mirror report of his affair. And then he's saying, I know from my experience as a government minister who had to deal with the floods of 2000, 2005 and 2007, that these are no longer once in a lifetime events. So here's the man. He's clearly an expert and the mirror is using him to give an opinion. What sort of opinion? Well, here we go. He states, uh, we were warned about the frequency of flooding and extreme weather a decade ago by environment experts such as Al Gore, Lord Stern, the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the Environment Agency. This isn't freak weather. It's now the norm and more frequent. I was always convinced that this was caused by climate change. And in 2011, a study of the 2000 floods by a team of climate scientists from Oxford University, the Met Office and other environmental institutions confirmed this. So according to Prescott, it's all absolutely confirmed. Believe me, uh, Mr. Prescott is saying, I can tell you how the global weather system works. Well, it gets even better. Uh, we've got the um, independent here and it's Mr. Cameron now in his smart yellow jacket saying that climate change and its risks are not going away. A scientist who co-wrote a report seven years ago predicting current levels of flooding says that ministers are still disinclined to do what's needed. The PM must show leadership. So you pick up leadership from Miliban, you pick up leadership from Cameron. What are they talking about? Well, we think we got a clue and we thank the viewer who sent us this uh, because it was this lady, Natalie Bennett, who did an interview with the BBC. Uh, she's lead of the Green Party. And she believes that any senior government advisor that refuses to accept the scientific consensus on climate change should be should be sacked. Now, I recommend unusually for me that you listen to this BBC interview because the the guy interviewing this lady was clearly shocked at what she said. He even said, well, do you mean any minister? You know, what, what about head of, of veterinary matters? And she said, anybody in a senior position who refuses to agree with consensus on climate change should be sacked. So it's pretty, it's pretty clear what's coming. So we emailed uh, the Green Party here and Miss Bennett, and I'll just read it as the print's a bit slow, I, uh, small. I just watched the BBC interview in which you suggested that senior government advisers in any position who do not believe in climate change should be removed from their posts. Many would consider this a very strong position. In an earlier telephone call, a member of your staff suggested that the evidence of climate change is widely available, but I would be grateful if you could direct me to the definitive documentary evidence held by the Green Party that demonstrates climate change and or any other evidence upon which you particularly reply in demonstrating the reality of climate change. Well, that was sent off on Friday. We didn't hear anything. So today I had to speak to um, this lady, Zoe, who's uh, recently been uh, or relatively recently appointed as a press officer. 
Uh, I have to say she got a little bit uh, shirty with me because she was astonished that anybody in Great Britain, including myself, would be the slightest bit suspicious about uh, matters to do with global warming. And uh, initially she wasn't keen to provide me with any evidence, but eventually she did come back with an email. I'm sorry the text of this is so small, but she said, here's more data for you. Are you dubious that evidence is concrete on climate change? Question mark. There is agreement within the vast majority of scientific community that global warming is happening. And she then uh, just refers to some documents, uh, men, many of which are talking about floods and saying they're not even sure whether climate change uh, has created it. So this is not exactly definitive information that comes back from this young lady. But what is fascinating was a shock and horror that anybody should actually uh, have an alternative opinion on climate change. So we did a little bit of research. But of course, if you dig into the Internet, you can find lists of many hundreds of scientists. Yeah just bring this one up. Uh, this comes from Wikipedia. These are scientists not convinced about man-made global warming and climate predictions. And uh, if we come in a different angle, these are scientists arguing that global warming is primarily caused by natural processes and not man-made activity. Uh, so at the end of the day, we can see that by all means, not all scientists are convinced. Not even close. Not even close, uh, but what we're now seeing is that if you don't agree with the climate change agenda, you can't be considered an appropriate leader uh, in Westminster and you're going to be ejected from your post. Mm. That's a pretty common purpose approach, isn't it? You don't, you don't agree with us, so you're going to be bulldozed out the way. Mm. Well, the same is going to happen in Scotland, I think. Uh, well... Um, of course, after last week's comments uh, by George Osborne regarding Scotland's uh, uh, using the uh, sterling and, and the so-called sterling zone, uh, Alex Salmond has decided he's going to go to Aberdeen today uh, to, uh, to give a speech to business uh, leaders, apparently, outlining well what's being described as a point-by-point -point deconstruction of George Osborne's uh, speech. Uh, so uh, he's saying the reality is the pound is uh, is as much Scotland's as it is the rest of the UK's. Do you agree with that? Um, well, it's sort of joining when it suits you and when you want to split off, it's all ours. Right. We and created it in the first place. Right. By suggesting otherwise, mm. otherwise he said the Westminster establishment, Tories, Lib Labour and Lib Dems are reaping a backlash from the or ordinary people of Scotland who feel that this is an attempt to bully Scotland ahe ahead of the democratic choice we all look forward to this September. Uh, and of course, that's that's pretty much, uh, um, it, it kind of gives us a clue as to what's really going on here, doesn't it? We've got uh, uh, Britain that really wants Scotland just to go away and leave it alone, at least the British government we're talking about here. Uh, uh, they want uh, Scotland to split off because uh, Nick Clegg, after all, is responsible for uh, the constitutional reform agenda, and this is part and parcel of that constitutional reform agenda. So despite Cameron and Clegg's claims that they, they would prefer that Scotland stays within the Union, in fact, they don't want Scotland in the Union at all. They want Scotland out, uh, and, uh, uh, and they're using uh, this sort of dictatorial stance with regard to the pound as, as uh, an effort to, to sort of bully the Scots. I think Salmon's absolutely right about this. However, he's wrong about just about everything else. Uh, because, of course, uh, also over the weekend and also on the Andrew Marr show yesterday, uh, President uh, Barroso was talking uh, about Scotland uh, and its relationship to the Euro European Union. Uh, and he was basically saying Scotland, once again, saying that Scotland would, quote, find it very difficult uh, to join the EU. Uh, and he said, uh, we've seen that Spain has been opposed to the recognition of Kosovo, for instance. So it is to some extent a similar case but because it's a new country. And so I believe it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, a new member of state coming out of one of our countries getting an agreement of the other existing member states. Now, uh, so what's what's clearly going on is that, that basically Scotland is being told that, that you're going to have to bend over backwards, bend over many different ways, it seems, uh, in order to you know, be uh, accepted into the European Union. Uh, and goodness knows what kind of uh, economic and other uh, caveats are going to be placed on them, yeah. indeed. Yeah. 
Well, it's fascinating to see that Mr. Salmon is there in Aberdeen. Of course, we reported uh, at the end of last week that um, anti-child abuse campaigner Robert Green had been arrested once again from his home in Cheshire uh, by um, local police and Aberdeen police taken north of the border, had appeared in an Aberdeen sheriff's court and uh, he's been remanded in um, Perth prison uh, due to appear in court again on Friday. Uh, but of course, um, amongst criticisms, Robert Green has been putting criticism at Mr. Salmon, who is uh, yet another person in the Scottish establishment who has failed to take uh, any meaningful action uh, to bring to light uh, the Holly Gregg case and indeed bring abusers into court. So it's fascinating to see that uh, with the furore around Robert Green and the Aberdeen area, that's where Alex Salmon goes. Mm. Is, is it an attempt to uh, uh, divert public interest from the protection of vulnerable children? Or is it because he thinks if he goes there, he can help influence whatever dirty deeds are being planned in the courts? Uh, but we, uh, we've reported that uh, aside from the matter of uh, child protection, Robert has also been highlighting uh, uh, recent activity with a very um, uh, well-known S&M club, Violate in Scotland, and he revealed that out of some 4,000 members, many of the people were connected not only with the Scottish judiciary, but also the Scottish legal system. So we're not sure at the moment whether perhaps some of the higher levels of the Scottish establishment are getting just a little bit windy, that there will be some exposures as to who has been dressed in what, really. Mm. So we'll, we'll keep you posted on that. But at the moment, of course, uh, Robert Green has appeared in court once again without his own legal representative present. Uh, we understand there's uncertainty as to what he's actually been charged with. But at the moment, he is in Perth prison. Um, read the uh, Friday, sorry, correction, Saturday morning UK column update and uh, we'll also be posting his prison number if you want to write to him. So, well, Just before we move on, some people in the chat box commenting on the Bradbury Pound, and of course we did say on Friday that, that, that if Salmon was actually a an, uh, an, uh, nationalist with regard to Scotland as opposed to an internationalist, he would in fact be um, promoting that policy. Um, yeah. Just over the weekend, um, somebody who was uh, promoting the Bradbury Pound on, on the Scottish uh, subsection on the reddit website actually ended up getting kicked off for mentioning um bradbury pound on that website so yeah. so clearly a, a contentious um a contentious discussion going on contentious um issue but even the bbc has had has had to backtrack on its reporting uh, over the lead up to the first world war um they talked about the financing of the war but uh, completely failed to mention the bradbury pound well it was worse than that because they said that money printing had been done by the bank of england at the time when in fact it hadn't it had been done by the treasury so mm. they actually lied in the report and that hupem has has um adjusted appropriately to so, some degree anyway. to some degree yeah, yeah. yeah. so the bradbury pounds uh, is absolutely a key uh part of the uh, strategy to get uh, the criminal element out of the banks and Westminster stay posted. Well, this is an interesting one. Yes, because Wicked Willie is in Colombia and I haven't seen uh, too much coverage of this in the mainstream press at all. Uh, he arrived yesterday and here he is uh, from his uh, Twitter feed uh, inspecting some boats used by the drugs cartels and apparently he was also inspecting some submarines. Um, probably better equipped than, uh, than the British Navy gets these days. But anyway, uh, he's there. I don't know why he's there. There to get his uh, Colombian marching um, uh, orders um, or perhaps to reinforce ties between the British and uh, Colombian governments. Uh, not that it needs to be uh, reinforced. Um, actually, as the uh, Mail reported uh, last year, uh, but anyway, if we go back to, to this one, he arrived in Colombia yesterday. He met the uh, Colombian Foreign Minister uh, Maria uh, Holgan, uh, and today he's going to meet Pre President Santos. And during the meeting with meeting with Holgan yesterday, uh, she pointed out that uh, the relationship between the UK and Colombia dates back to 1825, when the uh, when the first um, sort of uh, uh, treaty was signed between the two countries. Uh, and uh, um, he's 
going to also hold talks uh, with the finance minister and the defence minister, uh, since apparently the UK supports Colombia's efforts to tackle the drugs trade and organised crime. Uh, and Haig's visit to the, uh, today follows uh, Clegg's visit there earlier in the month, uh, and he announced a new bilateral trade target of four billion pounds by 2020. I think that's a lot of snow. It's a lot of snow, but um, presumably the Chancellor will be pleased with a visit to Colombia. Yeah. Uh, I'll let the audience think about that one. I just noticed in that article, Mike, that they're also going to be dis uh, discussing uh, ways to prevent sexual violence in conflicts. Yes. So they're not going to work to stop the conflicts in the first place, but once they've started a conflict, then they're going to try and get in to stop the sexual violence. That, that, is, that is William Higgs' biggest uh, campaign at the moment. To stop, to sexual, stop violence sexual violence in conflicts. In conflicts. So, so he William, starts it. Yeah, William yeah. Higgs helped stoke up the violence in Syria, which of course has now produced massive destruction and with the killing and the maiming and the torture of course comes sexual violence now he started it he's going to get in there well he won't get in there personally of course because it's too dangerous but he's going to work to stop the sexual violence mm. uh drugs only answer well yeah. and indeed syria continues because obviously the geneva peace talks have have broken up now uh, and in fact, the war of words between uh, Kerry and, and Lavrov continues with Kerry now saying that uh, Russia just needs to butt out, really, is really what is, is what he's saying. Uh, so Russia's support for the Assad regime is causing, quote, an enormous problem, uh, says Kerry. He says that uh, Russia is enabling Syria's president Bashar al-Assad to stay in power. He's saying that the Syrian regime stonewalled at Geneva. Uh, and is continuing to destroy their own country. Uh, and he said, I regret to say they're doing so with, the increase, with increased support from Iran, from Hezbollah and from Russia. So Russia is now being lumped in with uh, Iran and Hezbollah. Uh, and Russia, quotes, Russia needs to be a part of the solution, not to be distributing so much more weapons and so much more aid that they're in fact enabling Assad's double down, which is creating an enormous problem. I mean, this is sheer hypocrisy. We've got the US, Britain and NATO absolutely creating pressure on Russia through their missile defense, defense shields, through mo moving more and more arms and material into the country, including nu into the region, including nuclear weapons. And that's, cause that's naturally causing Russia to get a bit jittery. Uh, so it's hardly surprising that Russia is now uh, making sure that their allies in the region are supported and armed. Uh, and perhaps if some of the NATO pressure on Russia was diffused a bit, defused a bit, uh, Russia would also take a step backwards. Yeah. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, poor old uh, General Idris has been dumped by the Free Syrian Army. Now this is the man. This is the man that uh, Conservative MP Brooks Newmark met with in indeed, secret circumstances. Indeed, we'll yeah. come on to that in a second. So, yeah. so this is uh, he's been replaced by uh, Brigadier General Abdul. Uh, al Ila al Bakir, and uh, they're saying that basically uh, Idris had caused a paralysis within the military command in the past months, and that they needed to restructure. Now, uh, the Free Syrian Army was considered uh, by some commentators as being a moderate rebel group. Uh, it's Western backed. It was Western backed, but of course, in recent uh, months, it has been uh, increasingly sidelined by uh, various. Uh, much stronger um, influences within the uh, within Syria, particularly Al Nusra, which is of course financed through Saudi Arabia and so on. So yes, indeed, as you say, uh, undoubtedly Brooks Newmark will be uh, quite relieved, perhaps, that that uh, General General Idris has had to stand aside because he'll no longer have to ever meet him again and uh, have to explain why he lost the vote in uh, in Parliament for yeah. arming the, the rebels. Yeah, well, we're going we're to stay on that one. If you haven't seen a copy of the UK, the hard copy of UK column, uh, you might like to get it, not only for a range of good articles, but of course a specific article all about uh, Mr Brooks Newmark and his visit to Syria. Well, whilst uh, the political mindset, to use that politically correct phrase, is focused on uh, matters to do with flooding and climate change, uh, what we're seeing, of course, is moves towards the full breakup of the UK column. Uh, now, this is a full email that was sent to us um, last 24 hours. It says Vivian Redding is to deliver the 2014 Mackenzie Stewart Lecture at the Centre 
for European Legal Studies, University of Cambridge at 5.30 today. Anybody who can get to that, please would you, because we'd love to know what this actually uh, la- this lady says. And um, what she's going to be talking about, Great Britain and the EU inevitably drifting apart. And the person's commenting, the wording of the title makes it clear to my mind that she chooses the title for herself and that she's followed the German and Luxembourg practice of refusing to say United Kingdom. Uh, we, and he's saying that you, the UK columns pointed this out as well. Uh, you don't come across Cambridge lawyers saying Great Britain. And um, he's commenting on the fact that nobody will talk about England at the moment. And there was a couple of references. And at the bottom, the references were about um, a, a, a speech delivered by head of the Supreme Court, Lord Neuberger. So if we just look at the first one here, here's the lovely Vivian Redding. This was the lady who a few days ago was um, being uh, tackled in the paper because essentially she was saying most of the British public, well, we're just too ignorant to really understand matters to do with the EU. So it's not worth consulting her, consulting us. But of course, she'll come into um, she'll come into a university type environment in order to uh, deliver a speech about um, Great Britain and the European Union. Have a look at her background, because like most people from the higher levels of the European Union, she isn't really anybody. She uh, comes through as a journalist, and I think she's been a local councillor in Luxembourg. Well, of course, that put her on the global scale pretty quickly. I don't want to break your train of thought, as it yeah. were, but right at the start you said the breakup of the UK column, which of course was a mistake. It was, we were talking about the breakup of the UK. Right. Did I really say <laughs> that? <laughs> okay. That's shocking. It's did, obviously yeah. Monday morning. <laughs> well, you know what's on my mind is the breakup of UK. Yeah. Um, perhaps that's the reason why we're called the UK column. Is there going to be a United Kingdom? We think so. Well, here's the other man, Lord, Lord Neuberger. And he's been delivering inaugural Cambridge Freshfields lecture on the British and Europe. And um, uh, it's it's quite interesting. A lot of newspapers um, commented, have commented, sorry, it was Wednesday, the 12th of February. So this has actually taken place, um, but quite widely reported. Um, Now, what is this man up to? Because he's Supreme Court president. He's wading into a political debate over the European courts. And we're going to say, what is this? Duplicity, hypocrisy or a political agenda? He fails to mention the treason committed by Westminster in handing away powers and sovereignty to the EU. He fails to admit that England's closed star chamber courts with a single judge and no jury, which have been stealing children, property, committing people to prison and imposing fines, is in breach of the very common law which he actually mentions. So I don't really understand this gentleman. Ignorance, I don't think so for a, for a, for a uh, very, very senior judge. Um, political agenda, yes, I think that's what we're looking at. So these are some of the statements. He said in the Telegraph, European law had introduced welcome new ideas to British courts, the UK's legal system. And here he says it, that it's rooted in common law rather than continental style civil codes. And our law remains strikingly different. In other words, the notion familiar to any reader of British newspapers that is unacceptable for unelected judges to impose a diktat on a democratically elected parliament. The UK is not. This means that the idea of courts overruling decisions of the UK parliament, as is substantially the effect of what the Strasbourg Court and Luxembourg can do, is little short of offensive to our notions of constitutional propriety. So here we've got a British judge standing up and clearly getting involved in a a political debate, which he's not supposed to do. Uh, He's quoting common law, and yet he knows full well that the judges are running uh, courts to their own entire satisfaction in Britain with no jury, no members of the public and no press president. And then he's saying, well, we, the British, should be grateful that we've still got common law and not the European system. Yeah. But the other thing he says there that's quite interesting, uh, this means that the idea, the co- uh, sorry, this means that the idea of courts overruling decisions of the UK Parliament. So he's denying jury nullification there as well, which is also a common law uh, provision. Yeah. Uh, because 
Of course, juries can override the decisions of the UK Parliament if they feel that a statute is being applied inappropriately. Well, and of course, um, and I, I had the dubious pleasure of being in a court where effectively a judge directed the jury uh, to go outside. They took about 12 minutes to find a mother guilty. Um, they didn't even know why they were going outside. Mm. They didn't know what the case was about. And initially, they didn't even know that the mother was, sorry, the lady was the mother of the girl concerned in the trial. So the judge's words in that court were, so that this trial is not more of a charade than it already is, I'm going to ask you, the jury, to go outside and make an appropriate decision. Mm. And that appropriate decision was guilty. So um, do we trust uh, Mr. Neuberger? I'm going to say no. So here he is with The Guardian. Uh, in other words, um, the notion familiar to any reader of British news that it's unacceptable for unelected judges to impose a diktat is peculiar. So quoted again there and the bit about the courts being overruled. So pushed across the press and The Times here is also featuring him. So there was one other bit here. Um, in the course of his speech, he also set out what appears to be a novel constitutional precedent. While judges should not normally, sorry, not normally take public positions in political debates, he maintained different considerations apply if those debates relate to the legal system or the rule of law. Those are areas where the judiciary has unique experience and authority which sometimes carries with it a positive duty to speak out. By the same token, it's part of our function to explain the legal implications of any important issues being publicly debated. So basically, here is another case of a judge simply making up the rules as he goes along. He's not supposed to speak out politically, uh, but, well, he thinks he's got a duty to speak out, so he does it. So is this man an independent judge in a matter to do with the European Union or is he biased or is he working for a political agenda? I believe he's Privy Council. Mm. Well, we leave it to uh, people to decide. Um, these are really our thoughts. <clears throat> so in the Telegraph here, the headline was why British don't like the EU, no invasion for 950 years. This was taken out of part of his speech well, we thought we put up the real reasons why the British don't like the EU. And this is for the education of Lord Neuberger. Well, they're unelected. Uh, the European Union is riddled with fraud and corruption. They've got no audited and signed off accounts. They've set up a dangerous paramilitary police and intelligence system. Uh, they are unaccountable and they've got legally pr protected judges, many from communist European backgrounds. Uh, many of the EU officials and staff have freedom from prosecution. They've wasted billions of British taxpayers' money. They've destroyed British farming by the common agricultural policy. Uh, they've destroyed the British fishing industry. They've implemented GM crops. They've assisted the deliberate uh, flooding of UK via their making space for water policy. They've stolen British public assets, including the post office, railways, energy, etc. And now they're work waking to break up the United Kingdom into EU regions. And this man is trying to tell us that the British public are just a little bit worried because Strasbourg has been uh, mouthing off a bit. Where, where do they get these people from, Mike? Don't know. Um, well, Maybe we get a clue. I believe that in his early days he trained with N.M. Rothschild, but I'm sure all of those connections are, are long gone. Mm. Well, well, this gives a clue, doesn't it? Because uh, um, we saw earlier on um, the royal family and a bit of a disparity between what was going on there with their shooting of animals, but at the same time trying to protect them. And here we see the same type of attitude here because uh, Angela Merkel, of course, has been squealing uh, like, like a, well, she's been squealing a lot. A German bore. Well, indeed. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, about the NSA and so on and how despicable it was that the NSA was behaving the way that it was. But, of course, now we begin to see uh, what's actually behind it, as we, I think we, we called her on this a number of months ago, uh, because she is now embracing proposals to create what's being described as uh, a, data, a European data network that would keep emails and other communications on the European side of the Atlantic 
further from prying American eyes. So basically, basically what it boils down to is she likes the spying, but she doesn't like the fact that it was the NSA and GCHQ that was doing it. She wants a European spying infrastructure established now. Uh, and so she's going to use companies like Deutsche Tele Telekom uh, and other uh, European companies to build a kind of European internet. We're going to see start to see the breakup of the internet here uh, into various blocks, uh, blocks um, and uh, and those blocks are each going to be uh, data mined by uh, by governments and companies in, that have access to those blocks. Uh, and we're going to see, um, uh, I suppose, a data war uh, in the not too distant future. Yeah, well, probably Merkel's a bit upset that all her best expertise from the Second World War was hoovered up by the Americans and shipped back to set up the NSA. So. Um, Merkel's team would have had to spend quite a bit of time getting their, mm. uh, uh, their spying network set up. But of course, another reason why you uh, want to keep control of all the figures, uh, we're having a small print day today, but uh, this was from the Mail, and it was giving annual figures on the cost of EU regulations. And it said that the capital rules for banks was costing us 4.5 billion, the working time directive 4.1 billion, the EU climate and energy package, 3.4 billion, the temporary agency workers directive, 2 billion, and the energy performance of buildings directive, 1.5 billion. So we haven't totted that up for you. We'll let our viewers do that. But essentially, it's pretty clear to us that uh, um, the EU is bleeding the country dry, breaking mm. up the union. And uh, we've got top judges at the moment refusing to actually recognise and take action on the sheer treason being committed within Westminster. It's all in front of our eyes at the end of the day. So if you can tell somebody else, you get somebody else looking at uh, UK Column Live, please encourage them to do so. I encourage them to w come back at 7.30 tonight for, mm. uh, for the Crane Report, 7.30. Then we're going to have a repeat of the uh, today's of this news programme at 8.15 and then yep. at 9 o'clock, the latest edition of Fracking Nightmare uh, and uh, tonnes of news. Ian Green will have tonnes of news because tonnes of stuff has been happening up at Barton Moss uh, with, with, with the, the police. police. Yeah. Um, so lots, lots to tell you about tonight starting at 7.30. And while you're uh, able to come with us tonight to sit in comfort uh, to watch the programme, perhaps you give a thought for Robert Green, who once again is banged up in prison north of the border. What is his crime? Has he murdered somebody? Has he stabbed somebody? Has he caused violence on the street? No, his only crime is that he has been trying to get justice for Holly Gregg and indeed justice for the thousands of children that have been abused through the Scottish and British establishment uh, organisations uh, with the help and connivance of the respected police forces. So if you really want to get into the dirt of what's happening in this country and you haven't understood the subject yet, paedophilia is the means by which those in the political spectrum are controlled. Our governments love paedophile activity because they can control individuals to do the dirty bidding. That's how the wars get started mm -hmm. and the bankers' money spent. So give a thought for Robert Green. If you haven't sent an email campaign, your, uh, campaign to his MP and your own MP and contacted the national press, please do so. OK, thanks for joining us. See you at half seven tonight. Bye bye.